Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lello. And our guest for you this week is Jeffy Kennedy, who is a fantasy romance author who lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, with two Maine Coon cats, plentiful free-range lizards, and a very handsome doctor of oriental medicine. She's won the RT Reviewer's Choice Best Fantasy Romance of 2015, been a PRISM finalist, and won the 2017 Rita Award with her novel, The Pages of the Mind. And she's a mix of a self-published and traditionally published author. So we're going to ask her a bit about succeeding in both and uh, what she likes about both and what kind of marketing and all that good stuff she's doing. Welcome to the show, Jeffy. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. Well, do you want to tell us a little bit about your background and kind of how you got into, I assume you started with traditional publishing and then have been dabbling in self-publishing? Yes. Um, Like many of us, it's kind of a long and complicated history. I started out as a nonfiction writer. Um, Way back in the day in the early 90s, I started out as an essayist. I was getting a PhD in a science program, graduate program, and uh, figured out that I really wanted to be a writer, which was a big switch. So I started writing essays. And for a lot of years, my my very first book was an essay collection with the University Press. And then I ended up switching over to fiction, which is kind of a story of its own. Uh, But when I did that, I wrote this book that I didn't expect to write. You know, one of those things where I woke up from a dream and sat down and wrote it for six hours. And it turns out it was a fantasy romance. But this was like 2006 or seven. And the genre didn't really exist yet. And so I sent it out and I got, I didn't know how well I was doing. Part of it was because I'd been like part of, you know, like the creative nonfiction world and Wyoming Arts Council and all this kind of thing. So agents took me seriously and they'd, I'd get full manuscript requests all the time. And then they'd say, well, you're a great writer, but we have absolutely no idea what this story is or how to sell it. And so I spent quite a few years sort of banging my head against that particular wall. Uh, And then finally, I got in with Karina Press, which is uh, the digital imprint of Harlequin. And I started there actually with some erotic romance stories and then sold the this fantasy romance trilogy that I'd started. Um, An agent read one of those books and then sold me to Kensington. And that's my 12 Kingdoms Uncharted Realms series. So that, that sort of got me more firmly in with Trad. Uh, but about um, 2015, my day job left me. I was an environmental consultant for like 18 years and we got downsized. So I thought, well, I was doing fairly well. And I thought, well, I'm gonna try to see if I can make it with a single career. And so I uh, started self-publishing. And it's partly um, Annie Bullett's fault. I don't know if Annie's ever been on the show. She Uh, has been on the show. We get all the good people on the show sooner or later. (laughs) I have to say I'm I'm such a fangirl of the show. So I'm like kind of agog that I get to be on here. Uh, But Annie had posted something to the SAFWA forum, Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America, we had a thread going a few years back where people were sharing how much money they made in the interest of transparency and sort of, you know, sharing with other writers, you know, like, what is the range? What can you make? And I had read Annie's um, 20 sided sorcerer series, which I thought was awesome. And, but I also thought that she was like the same level of awesome that I was. I thought it might sound vain and arrogant, but I was like, Oh, well, you know, that's, She's a great writer. I think I'm an okay writer. And uh, so she posted how much money she made. And I messaged her privately. And I was like, Annie, why are you making so much more money than I am? <laughs> and she said, well, I think it's, it's the self-publishing. And I said, okay, well, what do I need to do? And she gave me a step-by-step. And I started self-publishing a fantasy romance series at that point. Yeah, I remember that big post she made, too. I think she had made 
two or three hundred thousand that year from her uh, her series. So yeah. not too shabby. <laughs> not not too shabby. It was like that sounds okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and we should point out that fantasy romance, you do most of like secondary world kind of epic fantasy, not the paranormal romance stuff set on Earth, which I think does have more of a market with, I don't know about traditional, but it's quite popular with a, on Amazon anyway. <laughs> no, I think that's correct. Um, and, and you're absolutely right. When we say fantasy romance, and like my new trilogy that's going to come out from St. Martin's starting later this year, they're calling it romantic fantasy. So I'm not really sure how we're parsing the difference between those. But what I always say is I think paranormal romance is where the romance is the main arc of the story with a little bit of woo-woo thrown in. Uh, a lot of jargon there. But whereas fantasy romance uh, is much more, I, I'd say it splits down the middle. Fantasy romance tends to be, yeah, alternate world fantasy and follows like hero's journey and a lot of the the more dense fantasy tropes but then the romance also plays in it's been nice that in the last few years at least amazon's made categories for uh fantasy romance and science fiction romance because i know i was kind of a fan around that that same era like 2007 2008 i remember finding uh linnaeus and claire she has had a whole series of sci-fi romance yeah. and i don't even know <laughs> fantasy romance like there was plenty of novel there have been novels with like romances in them but they weren't necessarily it's not the man chest on the cover you know or the even the couple and the clinch so you you just kind of happen to find it if you happen to be reading that author and like it yeah i mean there was c.l wilson was back then and she kind of kicked in the door and then yeah it was otherwise it was sort of who you could get you know Jacqueline Carey kind of was doing that all those hers are you know like romance like Outlander is romance you know so but definitely along those at least epic lines as a reader that enjoys this kind of stuff or who enjoys this kind of stuff, I, I feel like there's kind of been yet to be a really big breakout author in a fantasy romance. And I would love to see it. I've seen a few more come out of traditional publishing in the last few years. Um, I'm curious what you think. Is it, is it a growing genre? Is there, it's, it's hard on Amazon because you have to compete with the paranormal romance. People like to stick their books in that same category. <laughs> oh, they do. <laughs> um, I do think it's growing. I think it's, um, there's sort of a weird double thread of it because a lot of what I would call fantasy romance is coming out of YA fantasy. So like Sarah J. Moss and her, um, not the, the, what is it? A Court of Thorn and Roses, that trilogy is really very adult fantasy romance in many ways, but it's been put into YA. Uh, but uh, Grace Draven, who's a good friend of mine and started out self-publishing, uh, she really writes fantasy romance, and she just came out with the first book in a trilogy that she sold to Ace, uh, and that and um, Amanda Boucher had her trilogy from Source Books a couple years ago and did very well with that. And then St. Martin's picked up this one of mine, and I know that um, my editor was really excited to make this be St. Martin's fantasy romance. I just did a blurb for a, a new gal in, who's also source books that they, you know, bringing out as a, the hot new fantasy romance debut. So I do think that it's growing. I know that, you know, I, you get tagged on those threads on Twitter and that sort of thing where people are like, well, I read this, where are the other fantasy romance authors? And it's, it's still a fairly small group. Um, Thea Harrison gets tagged on it a lot, even though she really was very solidly paranormal romance for a long time. So that's a long answer. <laughs> That's all right. Uh, for those authors who are thinking, you know, this is really my cup of tea and I want to get into this. Are there any tropes or kind of established things that you feel need to be followed to satisfy the audience? Well, I think one of the most important things, and we, we kind of run into this over and over again with people who are moving into romance, is that, you know, the, the one golden rule, the one rule to rule them all 
of romance is that you have to have the happy ever after or a happy for now. You can't kill off the characters at the end or have them part forever at the end. And that's um, something that a lot of the more people coming from the sci-fi fantasy end of things tend to resist, you know, because they want like the tragic ending or they want the meaningful ending that, and they feel like the happy ending isn't necessarily meaningful. Uh, and then conversely, uh, people coming from the romance side, if you really want to, this to be fantasy romance or romantic fantasy or even science fiction romance uh, and not have it just be like paranormal romance, the world building has got to be there. And I think that's one of the greatest weaknesses I see in, in books that purport to be fantasy romance or even science fiction romance, because I read that a lot too, is that, um, you know, the world building's not dense enough. You really have to put your work into that as you would for if the romance weren't there. Right. I think a lot of the readers that maybe read sci-fi fantasy first and then decided, oh, I like some romance in there. They're going to be disappointed if there's not kind of the world building. And also I would say, uh, another storyline besides the romance like a little something more going on like i like a little action or mystery or you know something else besides just <laughs> the hero and the heroine will they won't will they or won't they no that that's absolutely right which is why you know like for fantasy i'll, I'll often say the hero's journey needs to be there and what's cool to me in fantasy romance or romantic fantasy is that very often the hero's journey is given to the heroine and the hero is the one helping her do that. Uh, there's a little bit more room for that on the romance side, I think. Uh, maybe just because a lot of the authors are female coming from romance, they're female. Um, and the stories lend themselves to being uh, female driven that way. Uh, you, you can have a heart, an arc for the hero as well, but sometimes it's really cool to give that um, epic sweep and the, the pivotal role in it to the female character. At least it is for me. <laughs> uh, on, the, on the same subject, uh, fantasy stories, particularly epic fantasy stories uh, and fantasy series, which you're saying like this is very much like, they tend to have very long and sweeping storylines. You're talking about a trilogy. Uh, romance, conversely, a lot of the romance authors we've talked to, it tends to be a one shot between two characters. Like you say, this has to have a happy uh, ending. So how do you balance that with fantasy romance? How do you have a, a, a sweeping storyline that has happy endings uh, in each book? Well, there's a couple of ways to do it. Um, one, like my 12 Kingdoms Uncharted Realms books, that's up to like seven novels and various novellas. And there's a different hero heroine in each book and it's their kind of romantic arc in each book they're coming together that's part of like whatever piece of the overall sweep that they are handling and then the next book like the next piece in the puzzle gets handed off to a different heroine and who then ends up finding a guy that helps her along the way or in, in my books I tend to do male female uh, so that's one model but like the trilogy that I'm doing for St. Martin's, I get to do the same hero heroine for all three books. So the first book is ended on the HFN, that's what we call it, the happy for now. Uh, they don't have to be like perfectly with the I love yous and we're a wonderful team. In fact, this book that's coming out in the fall, um, they're a, it's a marriage of convenience. So it's, a, it's an uneasy alliance, but there's potential and their relationship will continue to grow as they work together to bring down the evil empire, as, as one does. Of course. Uh, <laughs> when, it, when it's different heroes and heroines through each book, uh, is it traditional to sort of have the previous heroes and heroines show up or maybe in the last book just sort of come together? Because it seems like that's a structure that you would see in fantasy. Yes, and it's also a structure that's popular in romance. Um, Romance readers really love to see the happy couple from the previous books turn up and be and be happy. <laughs> um, Evidence that the happiness is ever after. Yes, yes. You know, we're proving the happy ever after. They really are making this work. Uh, having those interconnected characters, and I think I've heard you guys talk about this on the show before too with other authors, uh, that really helps the maintain the readership. And the readership loves to, to see 
you know, the people who are secondary characters in some books then later take over the story and uh, grow on their own part. Uh, and, and then seeing other characters come back again and do interesting things. So, yeah, it's really fun to do it that way. You sort of end up with this whole family of characters coming and going. Absolutely. Jeff, over to you. Okay, so my question would be, how much romance would you say has to be in a fantasy story to be considered fantasy romance? I mean, do you need to mention this story as a fantasy romance somewhere in the blurb so the readers know what to expect? Um, I think there needs to be 31.5%. <laughs> no, okay, not 31.4 or 0.6, but 31.5%. No, no, it, this is actually a common question, and it's hard to answer because the real answer is, is there should be as much as there needs to be. Um, I think that the best definition would be if it's fantasy romance or romantic fantasy, if you took the romance arc out, the story would fall apart, and vice versa. If you took the fantasy arc out, then the story couldn't stand. So really, this is very solidly cross-genre. You need both arcs for the story to make sense. And very often the romance is what figures into the character transformation. That's what um, is usually where the black moment is, and it's where the characters figure out that they have to um, be vulnerable, they have to let somebody else help them in order to move forward in the quest part of the story. So the, the two arcs become very interdependent. If There are certainly stories where the one is weaker than the other, and I don't find those as a reader as satisfying. Okay, I was just, I was just kind of curious, because uh, I've read some stories that have, let's say, for instance, like a husband and wife team. You know, they, obviously the husband and wife are in love. They can you know, touch on that several times throughout the story. And I've had some people say, oh, that could be a romance story. I'm like, yeah. I think there has to be more than that in there. But, uh, I was just curious. I don't, I don't think you'd have to have more necessarily, but you would have to challenge the romance in some way. So one way that that, if you have a husband and wife team that start out and they're completely on each other's team and they're great and they're happy and everything's going terrific and throughout the story, they're right there and they have each other's backs and at the end, everything's happy and that's terrific then it's not really a romantic arc. It's just a romantic element that, that it's in there. Um, if you want it to be an actual romantic arc, you would have to challenge that relationship in some way, which is fun to do with long-term couples because most of us have been in long-term relationships of some kind or another, and you know the sorts of things that can crop up after years of being together. So, you know, it's like, you always jump in and fight the monster instead of me. You don't really believe in me or something like that. And you can create a real crisis in the relationship and then have them have to rebuild from there. That's a weak example. But. Yeah, it works out. That completely answers it. I do appreciate it. Uh, Lindsay, let me hand, you, hand it back to you. We should point out to our listeners that Jeff is calling in this week, so we're not quite as smooth with our transitions as usual. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I apologize. I'm moving from point A to point B, so it makes it a little easier right. this way for me, but more difficult in the long run. <laughs> but that's a good point for uh, any romance that not only can they not just be complacent and happy the whole story if it's going to be a romance, but I often find as a reader that I, I'm, I'll be, if I'm bored, I realize it's because the two characters have no conflict and no real reason why they wouldn't hook up, so there's no suspense or anything to like keep you reading the pages to figure out how they possibly can resolve this and that's something i really enjoy when an author does well like a lot of conflict without making them jerks which yes is, like the easy way to make conflict is just for them to be really angry all the time for no reason but then you stop liking them as a reader it, it's very true the romantic tension really relies on them having a very real conflict for why they cannot be together you know, and when people complain about romance and say, well, how can you like romance? Because you know how it's going to end. And it's like, well, no, the whole point is the story. It's the whole point is getting there and finding out how they're going to be uh, happy together. And, and a good author of romance will have you utterly convinced that there's no way that this couple could possibly overcome the obstacles and actually be together. 
And that's one reason that fantasy is very fun uh, to combine with romances because you can create societies or um, different kinds of class conflicts or species conflicts that are very real reasons for, you know, why they can't be together. You don't have just the uh, warring families uh, between Romeo and Juliet. You'd have families that like maybe are actually different species. <laughs> Yeah, we're not into those guys. They have horns. They're not cool. But. That's right. <laughs> so I know you're active in both uh, RWA and CIFWA. Um, could you tell us a little bit about your experience with the organizations and if you'd recommend them both to somebody that's going to kind of straddle the line and do fantasy or sci-fi romance or if there's one that maybe, I know uh, RWA will take beginning authors and CIFWA, you have to, if you're self-published, I think you have to make 3000 a year for one book or something like that. I don't remember. Or a traditionally published deal. Uh, what are your thoughts on them? I, I do recommend both organizations. Uh, it's true that RWA, you only have to prove that you are working towards being an author. You have to demonstrate you're actually writing by turning in a certain number of words. Whereas CIFWA, you do have to reach a, a pay threshold. Uh, to to join uh, and because of that I was a member of RWA long before I was a member of SEFWA. I joined RWA in like 2008 when I was switching over to fiction and uh, then I didn't join um, SEFWA until like 2014 when I got my deal from Kensington and had an advance that was before they were accepting self-published writers it was like right around that margin uh, so, you know, both organizations I think are great. I, I'm a believer that if you are a professional in a field, then it's incumbent on you to be active in your professional organization to improve the field for everyone and for yourself. So uh, that's just kind of the background that I come out of as far as volunteering and so forth. I've served on boards for RWA for my local chapter and I'm on the board for CEFWA now. I'm a director at large, up for re-election this year, so vote for me. <laughs> I just finished my first term as a director at large and um, one of my jobs is the board. We have liaisons to the various committees and I'm the liaison to the self-publishing committee. So I like to do a lot of work for that. And I worked on the story bundle, which is how Lindsay and I started talking about doing this podcast. Uh, and then I'm also the liaison to the game writing committee. Ooh, so I, what's that? Is it fancy? Fancy, yeah. We worked on getting the Nebula Award for game writing. that could be offered this year for the first time. So that's kind of exciting. That is exciting. And game writing is uh, often overlooked considering it's an entirely different beast than regular writing. It is, and, and the great hurdles that we went through is that, of course, we still have traditionalists who say a story must be prose. And, <laughs> yeah, I roll. Uh, <laughs> and I'm a big believer, you know, that as technology changes, our media for telling stories change, and that game writing and, and rewarding game writing is, is really important because it's a different kind of narrative arc, but it's still storytelling. Yep. Uh, all right. So we talked last week about the sort of value authors can get out of attending events. And I know that both CIFWA and RWA have their own events, I think possibly multiple. Um, if an author doesn't anticipate attending such gatherings, like if they just don't have the capacity or tendency to travel, uh, is there still value in being a member? Oh, yeah. You know, because so much is online. Uh, CIFWA has, CIFWA and RWA both have the forums. Uh, RWAs, you can subscribe via email to them, whereas CEFWA, you actually have to go there. Uh, then CEFWA also has a Slack chat, which is where I hang out most days. A lot of people hang out there and have interesting conversations. Uh, and then with RWA, there are local chapters and special interest chapters. The special interest chapters are uh, completely virtual. So those are conducted on forums or email loops and they have um, virtual meetings. And then with CEFA, we're moving towards doing more of that sort of thing, having more local meetups and encouraging reading series and that sort of thing. Those are plans for the future. Cool, sounds good. Jeff, over to you. Okay, so 
I'm also a member of CIFWA, and I, I've always believed that having access to the organization's legal team, should you need it, to be the most useful benefit. Have you personally used any of CIFWA's services? I have not had to use the legal team, or there's also the emergency medical fund, which I'm really glad is there since I pay for my own insurance now, and it's... Uh, <laughs> It's like the, or your whatever they call it, like the bronze level of insurance, which means I don't get much. Uh, so, you know, uh, those sorts of things. The, I have gone to SEFWA for help with resolving um, some contracts questions. And most notably, I went to SEFWA for, to have people explain to me what it would be like on a planet with two moons. That was a really important. <laughs> you, you would not believe the information all these people gave me. I was, it was so much better than having to look it up. I bet. Um, yeah, a quick and easy question. Uh, Lindsay, back to you. The trouble with science fiction is you start researching the science and you realize there's like no way you could actually write the story you want to write if, if you do all the things that would be you would actually have to pay attention to in outer space yeah that's that's really the truth and and it's i'm a big proponent of trying to write as fast as possible uh, or trying to get things out of the way so you can write and one of the rules against uh when, Research doesn't count as writing. I mean, in, in, in my book, you know, so it's like uh, you have to try to balance that, the great idea with what's going to uh, suck up a whole bunch of time figuring out the research. Yeah, it's, uh, I just don't put my stuff in hard science. <laughs> I'm, try, I'm trying with the next series to be a little more realistic, but it's just never, like I saw a picture of uh, like this huge block of aluminum it got hit with a particle, like this, I don't know what it was, a half an ounce of plastic or something. And it would just blow a hole inside of your spaceship, basically, because we don't actually have technology now to make shields that are always in sci-fi. And we don't know how it could be done. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to have shields anyway. <laughs> Everybody well, else. That's, <laughs> that's what they do in Star Trek, right? I mean, shields up, shields down. Right. That's what that, what's so hard about that? <laughs> just ignore that we don't have any physics that would allow us to make them. <laughs> Um, but as I mentioned in the intro, you've been nominated for and won several awards, including the Rita in 2017. And for the sci-fi and fantasy folks who don't follow romance, that's a really big one in the romance community, kind of like the nebula in sci-fi fantasy. Could you talk about your experience with that and um, whether it's worth it to enter books in these competitions? Because they do have a specific uh, what do they call it, the paranormal romance category, but they allow any science fiction or fantasy under that? Yeah, um, the RWA categories are have been retooled over time because people can enter their books in the Rita. So you pay your $50 and enter your book, and, and they take you up until like 2,000 entries or whatever it is now, and then your books are sent to a panel of judges. So it's a little bit different than awards like the Nebulas or Hugo's or World Fantasy, where people you know sort of pick the books and nominate them. This is one where you know five judges rank the books, and then the books with the highest score get into the finals. Um, they right now the categories have been retooled to try to make it so that there's an equivalent number of entries more or less in each category. So like contemporary romance has been split up into three subsections, long, medium, and short, because there's so many entries in contemporary romance. Well, even though there are some of us who've kind of moaned and whined over the years that it doesn't make sense to have one category for paranormal romance, fantasy romance, science fiction romance, uh, time travel, <laughs> time travel like ends up being in there, uh, you know, sort of, uh, that's why I always make the joke about, you know, like anything woo-woo ends up gets getting dumped into RWA's paranormal romance category. So uh, I sometimes get people asking me why that book won the paranormal romance, Rita. You know, and it's like, well, you know, it's just sort of a big umbrella. Well, I know I've read at least one sci-fi romance that was, it was either a winner or a finalist. So it's encouraging that 
<laughs> you know, because I know now this is the first year I read for it to, to be one of the judges that people who are not sci-fi fantasy fans are probably the ones judging it because you don't judge in your own category that you entered in. Right. So that makes me wonder like, wow, is anybody that's not into sci-fi just me like, eh, one, <laughs> there were spaceships and they had shields. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, at least, you know, you know, the people who are like really the contemporary romance writers aren't going to give you trouble about whether or not the physics of your shields make sense. So that is a plus. Uh, the my book that won, I was kind of surprised that that was the one that finaled and won. And it was the first time I finaled too, and I was surprised because it does not follow some of the standard romance tropes. And for people who are more who are coming out of like contemporary romance or historical romance, they look for certain things. Uh, and the pages of the mind. Uh, my heroine is a librarian who's sent off to be a spy. And she actually doesn't meet the hero until the end of Act One, around 25% into the book, which in romance is kind of a no-no. Um, a lot of the romance people expect to see the hero and the heroine in the first couple of chapters. And even if they're not in the same place, they would alternate with each other. So they, they want to know romance readers often want to know who the hero is going to be if you're following the heroine. And in that book, they didn't. But um, it was one that, you know, a lot of people love for whatever reason. Yeah, I saw your blog post when I was looking for questions for the show, and you, I didn't realize you had entered every year for many years. And I, I guess that's actually a really good way to think about it, rather than like, oh, this is the greatest story I've ever written. This is the one I should enter because you're going to get different judges every year and who knows something is somebody's cup of tea and not somebody else's. Um, but what would you say, did it open any opportunities for you? I know you were already traditionally published, but, uh, or did it increase uh, sales noticeably for that book? Uh, yes. It, it, and, and if you saw that post that I wrote about it, that has been a popular post because it was one, you know, why you should enter the reader. Uh, and the first reason is because you can't win if you don't answer. Um, and yes, I had been entering books every single year since I could. Um, I think that you, you hear arguments from people that the Rita doesn't give you sales, it doesn't necessarily give you new readers, that the readers don't know what it is, uh, that they don't care. And I think a lot of those things prove not to be true. Uh, one thing that was wonderful about it was that Finaling, just finaling was fantastic. And I'm, while I really love having my shiny trophy, uh, which I have like up on the shelf right over my desk so I can look up at it whenever I'm like floundering in a book, it's like, no way, there's, a, there's my validation. <laughs> uh, but when you, when you final, lots of, you get great attention. It's amazing. Um, a lot of uh, book groups do tournament reads where they will read all of the Rita finalists and do betting pools on who they think will win. Uh, bookstores do features, you know, because my readers were sending me photographs. Then they were sending me photos of like the table at their library or at the bookstore showing my book among the Rita finalists, you know, and they would have signs saying, who do you think will win? And I know I picked up a lot of readers that way because I would get tagged on reviews of that book, which is technically the fourth book in the series. And people would say, you know, give it this really lovely review. And they would say, but warning, you're immediately going to want to go back and read book one. And I'd be like, yay, <laughs> That's, go, go read book one and read all of them. So I know that I picked up a lot of readers that way. Um, that's a traditionally published book, so of course it took time for the numbers to percolate through. Uh, so I know that that book has sold really well. It's hard for me to tell if there was like a particular bump around that time. But um, the other thing that it did, and I think it's something that that you get with traditional publishing, and and there are people who have uh, 
I had a critique partner who actually her book was the first self-published book to win Arita. And it was a year or two before mine won. Uh, is that you get this tremendous validation from it. Uh, one thing that was amazing to me was when my book finaled and I was at the RWA conference, I had these big name writers who there was no way they had ever known who I was who were coming up to me and congratulating me and, and asking me how to pronounce my name. <laughs> uh, and that was, um, I think that there is something that comes from having other authors in the field know who you are that opens doors. Because then when they are putting together panels or workshops and that sort of thing, then they know who you are and they think of you. Uh, they ask you if you want to participate in cross-promotional efforts with them. You know, they're, they're your friend on social media and they'll talk you up. And I think those things, while there's not a direct ROI, that it's not, it's not inconsiderable at times. Uh, so those were, um, those were huge benefits. And I really do recommend that people enter these contests. Uh, it's, it, I think it does give you a boost on all kinds of levels. Now, uh, like the Rita, you submit and it's judged by other authors, but others, uh, you know, you either submit and hope for the best or you don't submit and hope other people submit and vote for it. Uh, is, is, a, like, is an award something that's worth lobbying for or is that like tacky? <laughs> well, you know, in the, on the sci-fi fantasy end of things, you know, we have these awards like the Hugo or World Fantasy or Nebulas, you know, uh, Safwa just finished voting for the, the Nebula nominations. Uh, you know, and it is considered, it, it, it's taken me a while to get to know this world because I was in romance first. And the two communities can be really different in their approach to things. So the sci-fi fantasy world tends to be a little bit um, prickly about people lobbying for awards, you know, that it's really just not done. Um, certainly no log rolling, uh, you know, where you do the thing like I tell Lindsay, well, if you uh, nominate my book, I'll nominate your book, and we just roll it on down the line. Uh, those things are strictly frowned upon. At the same time, when you don't have an opportunity to nominate your book for the contest, then there ends up being, you know, this... I don't know, it's a, it's a double-edged thing, right? Because you have to let people know about your book. And the books with a lot of buzz are the ones that tend to get nominated because people are like, oh, yeah, I heard, I heard of that book. I, maybe I should look at it. So it's a, I don't know, it's, it's a difficult conundrum, I think. There are times when it feels like winning an award, especially in science fiction and fantasy, which is where I write, is like trying to win the lottery when other people have to buy your tickets for you. Oh, I like that. That's <laughs> a good <laughs> analogy. Yeah, and, and I'm sorry, you, didn't, you asked me if the awards are worth chasing. You know, I think awards can bring you notice where other things don't, but I don't think it's the be all and end all. Um, one of the things we do in CEFWA while I'm talking about CEFWA programs is we have this mentoring program that another one of the directors at large, Sarah Pinsker, really spearheaded and got it going. So I have a few mentees in CEFWA, and with all three of them, I ended up sort of at our initial meeting coming up with asking them to make a list of what they wanted out of being a writer. And I asked them to put it into categories, you know, and I said, there, you know, there's money and there's ego and there's feeling like you've created art or there's um, having a lot of readers, you know. So there's, it, it's interesting because being a writer involves so many different facets and you're going for different things. I mean, you guys have had guests on your show who are like, I don't care about anything except getting my dollars from my KU Patriots. You know, I don't care about it. I don't know if anybody knows what my name is. I don't care. I just want those dollars. Um, other people are like, well, you know, money's not as important as feeling like I actually created something worthwhile. I could make, uh, I could, I could make money more easily doing something else 
but I really want to create stories. So awards, I think, are one facet of that. Very true. Jeff, what about you? All right. Okay. So, are, okay, you've been talking about awards. Are, they, are you aware of any other awards that self-pub authors sh should be striving to obtain? I mean, as Lindsay mentioned earlier, is, is it worth a tanner? Um, I don't know about other ones. Uh, you know, the I got a couple of awards and num and finals from our T magazine, and they're defunct now. That was really great and very helpful to my career early on. And so I would have said, you know, strive for those, but those were reviewers' choice awards, so you would get those by get you know try and get them to review your book and then um but other than that you know it seems to me like there are fewer awards now than there had been for a while i i advise you know getting the nobel for literature i think that would be helpful <laughs> <laughs> that would be a good one <laughs> <laughs> all righty all right well let me hand you back to Lindsay so we can get going on some marketing and blogging questions for you yep and we should say too people should be careful uh not just enter any old contest because there are a lot of them out there that will just take your money and there's nobody's heard of them so even if you won it wouldn't be worth it <laughs> yes it, it's very true and the the rule of thumb generally is as if they want to want money from you to enter although on the romance side it's very standard to ask for a monetary entry to enter a contest or a monetary fee to enter a contest. Um, so that's not a, an across the board rule, but you know, mostly you want to writer beware. Seth was writer beware. We'll list a lot of the contests and if they're world, worthwhile. Uh, Seth recently just made the move that we will no longer consider a contest win for membership. If you get publication as part of the contest win prize, then the amount you're paid for that publication can be counted towards membership, but not the contest money, if, as it were. So, and, and that's been in an effort to try to divide out some of these contests that aren't, uh, well, that are, that are working, that are preying on younger writers. Right, and with the romance one, my last point on this topic, we've been going on a bit, I know, um, is just that if somebody does want a traditional deal, I've seen, like, I, I think Amy Rabby, Amy Rabby, I'm not sure if she's still publishing, but I, I watched her, she was in my uh, online work, writing workshop together, start out with sci-fi and fantasy trying to get published, and then she went over, because she was writing basically fantasy romance, she went to RWA and, you know, entered, I think the chapters have contests, and worked her way up, and got a publishing deal by winning awards, so that's an option for those who don't want to like stock agents at conferences. <laughs> it, and there's a lot more of that on the romance side than the sci-fi fantasy side. And I, I don't know why. Sci-fi fantasy agents want to be stocked at conferences. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> um, yeah. But so let's talk a little bit about marketing. Uh, what have you done over the years, uh, both as traditionally published and self-published you know, like what's, I guess what's been remarkable and continues to work for you or is it just changing and you're trying new stuff all the time like most of us are? Um, I think, I think changing things up all the time. I am not a marketing person. I am, uh, you know, trained as a scientist and then I'm a writer and I don't really, um, I'm not one of those people who understands marketing. One reason why I like this podcast is because you do have real people talking about the things that they've actually done and what they're changing up instead of it being the, you know, buy Amazon ads or, you know, buy Facebook ads or whatever. Uh, for me, one thing I've done all along is I, I do social media. And I'm a believer that social media so, should be social. So even though I have an assistant, I handle a lot of my social media myself. And I only do the things that I like to do so that, you know, I try to let my personality come through and engage with people. I'm a, a big fan of telling people that the, the other word for networking is, or the other phrase for networking is making friends with people. So I'm, I'm a fan of, of building communities and making friends with people. 
Um, I do blog. I blog less than I used to, which I think is part of the changing things up. Um, and, you know, I try to be aware of what's, where, where people are, where the readers are talking about things and being engaging with the readers and with the book bloggers. The book bloggers have always been, from the very beginning, have been great to me. Um, you know, like from that first Karina Press book, some of the book bloggers picked up those books and they would, you know, talk them up, talk them up to other people. And that's, you know, boy, you can't, can't buy that. Uh, I really pay very little for ads. I almost never do ads of any kind. I don't, I don't like giving Facebook money <laughs> for a lot of reasons. Um, one, you know, the thing that I really believe in most is the cross promotional effort. I believe in finding um, other authors who have an audience that potentially overlaps with yours. This is part of the making friends with people thing. And then you do group projects. Uh, I like to do things like the story bundle. I think those are great for um, getting people who think, oh, well, I love Annie Bullett or I love Lindsay Broker. And so I'll get this whole packet of books and then maybe I'll find a new to be author. Uh, the other thing that I've done the last couple of years is been in uh, anthologies that we have self-published that I've done with three other authors. So two years ago, I did a holiday, fantasy romance holiday anthology with Grace Draven, Elizabeth Hunter, and Thea Harrison uh, that was called Amid the Winter Snow. Uh, this year, I did another one that was, again, fourth person. It was with Jennifer Eastep. Grace Draven, Amanda Boucher, and myself. And that was Seasons of Sorcery. So we each do a novella that ends up being, uh, you know, 26 to 30,000 words. And we sell the four-part anthology for $5.99 or something like that. So we end up making back our investment pretty quickly. We make nice money on those anthologies, which is really helpful. Uh, but then we also end up, we could see the effects of that because we'll see our readers say, well, I picked this up because I had to read Jennifer Eastep's novella and I discovered two new to me authors and now I'm going to go read their whole series. Uh, I really like doing that because it's being part of a community. I get to work with these other authors where normally I'm sort of a lone ranger. Uh, we get to put together something that our readers really want. So I don't feel like I'm just sort of dunning them with by my book. Instead, we're saying, oh, hey, here's this cool thing we put together and they get excited about it and we're excited about it. So those are, I think that probably covers all of my marketing strategies. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, I did tell Lindsay when she said, did I want to come on the show? I was like, well, I'm not the, uh, the poster child for marketing. Uh, a lot of stuff you're saying, like social media and uh, networking in general, uh, blogging and the like, it's all very hands-on. It's lots of upkeep. Uh, in your observation, does it seem like anything that's worth doing, like that's, that really pays off, is the sort of thing you really need to stay on top of and, and keep tweaking and just contributing to? Um, well, I think pretty much all social media is like that, right? You know, you can't let your stuff go stale. It's you ever you know, look up an author to see who they are and you go to their Twitter feed and they haven't tweeted since like December of 2017 or something and you're like, did they die? What happened? <laughs> uh, so I do think that that's, um, it, it's the difficult side of social media is that you have to find the balance between your being your authentic self, but you also have to be your, the entertaining face of your authentic self so that people get are interested in hearing from you. Uh, and then you do have to touch back frequently so that people know you're alive. And um, sometimes I'll, you know, I'll get busy writing a book and I won't post anything to Facebook for a few days and I'll get people asking where I am. You know, they'll say, well, did something happen to you? <laughs> it's like, what? It's been four days. <laughs> but that's how social media works. You know, it moves fast. Absolutely. Jeff, what about you? 
<laughs> All right. Okay, so since you've been writing now for a few years, and obviously you've been doing some marketing here there, what would you consider to be a marketing no-no that you frequently see other people do? Oh, I hate to brag on other people. Um, I, you can I say person I, A did this, person B did this. And... What's that? I would say you could just say a person A did this. And <laughs> I wouldn't recommend, or a person B did this. And... I don't no know. Names. You know, I think um, you know a lot of people are trying really hard, and I think letting your desperation show is a big no-no. There are sometimes people get into these things where they um, you are posting ads all the time, and I end up taking them out of my feeds because all I ever see from them. Is, is essentially by my book. Um, I think one of my least favorite things that I see authors do is like when they post the memes about how their readers should leave reviews. You know, the, I don't think that it's the reader's responsibility to do anything for us, that once they buy our story, then it's everything that happens after that is up to them and they don't owe us anything. So I, I have problems with that sort of thing. Um, and then it's a, it's a personal thing, but we were actually having a big conversation about this today in the Southwest Slack chat about the box sets that are aimed entirely at, you know, like getting on the USA Today list and you pay a bunch of money to get into the box set and do the marketing. And, you, you know, the whole point is you never get your money back, right? Because, you, you know, there's like 20 or 30 books for 99 cents. and you know, your fraction of a penny is never going to come back. So it's really essentially buying a big ad so that you can be a USA Today bestseller. You know, I don't think that those things really do that much for you. I think you can, you know, you'd be uh, better served to put your money and energy into actually creating more stories. And I'm a believer that, you know, in that whole write the next book thing. That's one of the best yeah, I kinds hear that. of marketing. I, 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 see, I, I couldn't agree more with you when you're saying that the last thing you want to do as an author on Facebook is just keep posting over and over and over. Buy my book or this book out, this book. I Unfortunately, un, I mean, I haven't unfriended, but I've unfollowed quite a few people for doing just that. Just drives me insane. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess on the same note, I don't really love the the newsletter swaps where people just simply – you know, do any swap for a newsletter. I, I do put other people's books in my newsletter sometimes. I talk up other people's books. I sometimes burn books. But it's always because it's something that I read and that I really, I don't take it lightly when I recommend to my readers and say, I love this, I think you would too. And I think sometimes if you're, you're simply swapping and exchanging recommendations, then you lose that credibility. And it makes it invalid after a while. Right. I, I do the same thing. Like the only, I haven't recommended many, but the only ones I do recommend are the ones I personally read and say, hey, if you guys like my books, I really think you ought to give these a try because they're pretty good. But yeah, I hear you. Uh, all right. Let me hand you back over to Lindsay for the next question. Well, you mentioned being a fan of social media and we've been talking about that, or at least you're on there <laughs> willing to do what you need to do as an author to have a presence. Uh, which is your favorite platform and which do you think is most effective for you? Um, my, my favorite platform has been Twitter for a long time. Um, although I ended up backing off of it the last couple of years uh, with, with the U S election and all that happened, it got, um, I was not having fun on Twitter anymore. And I really had to go through, I used TweetDeck and I had to go through and really recurate my feeds. Uh, a lot of the people I liked to follow had political opinions that I agreed with, and yet I couldn't hear it all the time. You know, the echo chamber became kind of a, a din. So I, um, I, I began using Facebook more, um, which is kind of ironic, I think. but. I could sort of filter Facebook a little bit better. Um, and, and this is terrible, but I post a lot more than I look. Whereas with Twitter, you know, I always talk about Twitter as being like the big cocktail party. You, you, you have to tweet and talk to people or you just don't really get much out of it at all. So 
I guess that probably answers that. <laughs> yeah, those are kind of the two that I do for the most part. Um, and I know Facebook is sort of the most bang for your buck as far as I've noticed kind of, and I'm kind of in that same area you are, fantasy, romance, sci-fi, or with romantic elements at least. And uh, I know I've seen data too, that just there's so many people are on there, especially above, you know, maybe 25. Like if you're doing YA, they seem to be maybe more on Instagram and, and Snap, is it now? <laughs> I don't even know, I'm getting so old. I don't know the, the cool new social medias. Um, but I know- I do like Instagram. Yeah, I, I post pictures now and then, mostly of my dogs. I don't think my dogs are selling a whole lot of books, but I'm I'm trying to figure out how to harness them, you know, to, to <laughs> for me. <laughs> but as far as what you do post, I, I know on Facebook, I've had a lot of luck with snippets that are funny snippets from whatever the work in progress is. I just did one the other day and, you know, it's great when uh, people will share them. And so you can possibly reach people that are not, already following you and then if they're humorous you people will come back to you and check out other stuff and I mean not that everybody has the right humor but if there's something about them that particular snippet that intrigues someone to check it out I, I love those for uh, you know people always like what do I post what do I post uh, you know I see a lot of people doing news stories and linking to stuff and I do some of that but I hardly ever get retweets or so much of activity on that kind of thing whereas if I post a snippet or something about myself my books it's a lot more popular I don't know so I'm rambling now I should let you ramble since you're our guest <laughs> <laughs> no I agree I, I I like to put up snippets I find um like if I find mistakes that I've made as I'm drafting sometimes I post those I I once put up a post because I was revising and I discovered that I um the wall was studded with flaming scones instead of sconces <laughs> So I, I shared that, and that post got, like, more interaction than almost anything else. People were really riffing on burning pastries. Yeah, my autocorrect. I like to blame autocorrect. I did not make that right. word, obviously. <laughs> autocorrect. Yesterday, I was had an enchanted immune system instead of an enhanced immune system. Oh, I was wondering what it was. I, I saw you tweet about that and I was wondering what it was supposed to be. I, I love the idea of an enchanted. <laughs> I know, it was quite popular. Everybody wanted one. Everybody that has issues was like, please sign me up for one of those. <laughs> um, you mentioned liking the book bloggers. Are there any for a fantasy romance in particular? Are you able to pitch them or do you just kind of have to hope maybe they'll notice me? <laughs> well, at this point, and, and I will actually congratulate myself for this, that I was smart early on that I started keeping a list of everybody who had ever favorably reviewed my books. Uh, and so now we have, my assistant helps me with this, we have a list of the reviewers who really like um, fantasy romance. And I will send out to them separately when I have a book coming out. And I'll, and she'll, well, she will, you know, and she'll say who wants an arc of this book, who wants to review, and she'll, she'll schedule them out so that they post reviews at various times, you know, and stagger it out and sort of create our own little blog tour. So I actually will share that with people if, if they like, or I will, my assistant will send out and say, you know, hey, this person, we think you might like their book. Would you like to, uh, you know, would you like a review copy and check it out? So that would probably be easier than me trying to think offhand of who those people are, because I would inevitably leave somebody out. But, you know, there's a, there's a core group who really love fantasy romance, and they, um, they'll talk it up once they find ones that they like. Just for the record, I want the recipe for those flaming scones. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the trick is getting them to stick to the wall so they're at, at intervals, you know. That's, that's when you cook it at too high of a heat and it's still raw on the middle and char <laughs> flaming on the outside. <laughs> um, as far as blogging itself goes, it sounded like uh, you said you might not do that as much anymore. Are you? Is that something a newer author should just ignore or only post when a new release comes out? I've, I know it can be a lot of work to post regularly, so I've fallen along the wayside on that too myself. I think blogging is really good because it keeps your website active that you always, and at this point I blog on my personal website once a week, and then I'm part of a group blog, the SFF7, 
um, that each of us posts on one day of the week and I post there on Sundays. Uh, those are good because the Google search results pick those up, uh, which is great for like if somebody's searching for your name, it puts it higher in the SEO. And also those are things that live forever and that you have more or less control of if it's on your website. So people will go, people will find my blog posts and they'll, you know, bring them up periodically. And I say that with the caveat that blogging is fairly easy to me because I used to be an essayist. So I, and I don't really use my essay juice that much anymore, but it's pretty easy for me. I keep a, a list when I think of topics, I sort of have a blog topics word document and I'll just, if I need to write a blog post, I'll go look at that and then I'll just go riff on that idea for a little while. Now, as we were saying earlier, this is, and uh, this is the sort of thing that you need to keep at, you know, it's got to stay active and alive. And if you aren't the sort of person for whom blogging comes uh, naturally, it, would you recommend something like, you know, on, on social media, you'll see stuff like throwback Thursday, uh, where, where they'll just, just, it's just a theme to help you create content. Like, well, I can think of something I did, you know, five years ago. Is that the kind of thing that's worth doing or does it end up just sort of cluttering your blog with stuff that maybe people aren't that interested in? No, I think those things are really good. Um, Throwback for Thursday is, is fun because people love seeing those old photographs and they make you go dig out the, the old paper ones, the Polaroids and so forth and scan them in, which you need to do anyway. So that's <laughs> before they all crumble away. Uh, you know, on Facebook, I know some authors are part of the just post anything, you know, and it's like, you know, people respond really well to just any little thing about your life. You know, I think, you know, Lindsay's dogs probably make people happy. Uh, people like seeing the new pair of shoes that you bought. And, you know, we, you know, we used to joke about Twitter was all about what people had for breakfast, you know, and now I kind of long for those days when it was... <laughs> Only <laughs> about what people had for breakfast, but you know, I think, I think that there's probably too much emphasis on that it's got to be somehow profound or meaningful, whereas the things that people respond best to are often things like flaming scones. You know, that's whatever makes people smile. Sure. Uh, over to you, Jeff. All righty. So, okay. So, when you're writing new blog entries. Uh, what do you typically write about? And and you mentioned how often you post your entries. I wanted to. I'm curious, like, how? What is the minimum number of days to wait until creating another post? You mentioned sometimes you do a new post several times a, a week. Should you should you do it more than that, or can you wait, or what would your opinion be? Well, the other thing I I've gone to blogging just once a week because the other thing I'm doing is I have a little podcast of my own, which is not as uh, fantastic as what you guys do, but I four days a week I do what I call first cup of coffee, and I just do 20 minutes while I drink my first cup of coffee, and I talk about what I'm working on, and then I post that on the blog as well. I think that having some kind of fresh content at least once a week, preferably a couple of times a week, is probably good because it like it helps keep you up in the search results. And also it's, I'm a big fan of building habits, you know, and if you get in the habit of doing a thing, it's a lot easier because you just expect to do it and you could just get it up there and get it done. And, you know, with blog posts, it doesn't have to be some sort of long screed. You can write something that's 200 words and people like that because they can read it really fast and it can just be, you know, like a funny thing you saw. Uh, do you typically write about your, your novels, what you're working on, or just like say something that, that happens to you throughout the week? Like you saw this movie and you thought it stinks and then, and, or you went to this new restaurant and man, that was good. I mean, how I often do, do you actually do write entries about your books? Um, you know, partly because I come out of being an essayist and I wrote creative nonfiction for personal essays. I talk about things that I'm thinking about, things that happened to me and why I thought they were weird or meaningful. Um, I sometimes, you know, I, I do talk about a wide range of things. I don't always talk about what I'm working on, but I talk about things that are going on in my life and how that affects my work and trying to be a, a full-time writer and, the, you know, the days that go well and the days that don't and 
when the finances are going well and when they're not. I, I, I try to be honest with people about my life and share them as if they're my friends. <laughs> Good to hear. All right. Uh, okay, let me hand you back over to Lindsay. All right, we've been chatting for about an hour, so I'm just going to ask one more question here for myself. Um, do you have any tips specifically for those authors who are writing the sci-fi romance or the fantasy romance that you found particularly effective for uh, kind of hitting, <laughs> finding the readers of both of those genres? Oh, finding the readers. We have selling books, finding the readers. <laughs> um, I think it's easier to find the readers if you go in the romance end. Um, it's one of the things that I've observed that's a difference between the romance and the sci-fi fantasy communities is that uh, the sci-fi fantasy folks tend to be a little bit like, prove to me why I should read your book. Why is your birth book worth my time? Whereas the romance people are like, I am looking for a new author. Are you a new to me author? Yay, let me look at your book. Uh, the, the romance readers are voracious, and they are always looking for something that will ring their particular bell. So I think that they are, in some ways, m more receptive. And also the sci-fi fantasy folks, there's a significant contingent that won't read anything with the romance in it. You know, that's like the romance cooties. So you either have to trick them <laughs> and slide it past or uh, just leave them alone. Whereas the romance people, you can get the romance readers to read pretty much, they'll, they'll read any level of science fiction or fantasy as long as the romance is in there and you don't lose them with the physics of the shields. <laughs> this is probably true. I had a kind of a grumpy reader guy, an older guy, email me and complain because he was in like book three of my Fallen Empire series. And he's like, it was like, Kevin Savage in The Princess Bride. Is there going to be kissing in this? I'm not going to read any farther if there's going to be kissing. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there's, this is turning into a kissing story. And, but in my point of view, in the very first blurb, you know, it kind of hinted that, yeah, there's going to be a little romance yeah, along the way. But you're not going to get that from romance readers. Yeah, that's true. Uh, there's a guy I see uh, regularly at a local sci-fi fantasy con who says he loves my books. But he's come up to me and said, you know, he says, well, I love your books, but I read them for the plot and I just skip the pornography. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> um, my question sort of has already been covered, but uh, I thought I had is you talk about how, uh, you know, romance readers are more uh, likely to try a new thing, whereas sci-fi fantasy is not. If you've already written a sci-fi fantasy and you were going to give – uh, romantic fantasy a try are you better off are, are you are you likely to get anybody to follow you into the genre or are you better off doing a pen name oh i think people would follow you yeah i i don't think um yeah i think as long as you cue the romance readers that you've you know got the got their catnip in the story then they'll they'll try it out excellent uh Jeff. But, as long as you don't violate the HEA, then they'll never forgive you. Follow the rules. Yes. Any more questions, Jeff? Okay, I've, I've got this one, and it's not really that specific to what we've been talking about, but I'm just curious. If you weren't writing fantasy romance, is there any other genre you'd like to dip your toe in? Um, you know, for me, I've sort of been herded into genre. I feel like um, I really like writing a story in the first place. I've written some straight uh, contemporary romance and erotic romance. I've also written some high fantasy that didn't have much romance in it at all. Uh, so yeah, I, I kind of go all up and down the spectrum, as it were. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's it for me, and I'll hand you back to Lindsay, so we're going to wrap this up for you. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And what was the name of your podcast? Is that something people can look up on iTunes or is it just on your website that you're posting? Oh, uh, no, it's, it's on iTunes. It's called First Cup of Coffee. Okay. I will find that and put the link to that in the show notes. And do you have any projects coming out or they just came out that you want to mention? Um, I just had the fifth book in my fantasy romance, the self-published series, the Sorcerer's Moon series just came out last month and I've like 
today and tomorrow finishing the sixth book, and that'll be out soon. So, Oriah's Enchantment and Lonan's Reign. All right, I will grab the links for those two, or maybe I'll send them to book one. Is it one where they need to read the whole series? I know some runs. It really is. That about. one's yeah. almost more of a serial, so. All right, maybe I'll send them to book one. And uh, mention your website, please, and where people can find you online. JeffyKennedy.com. Well, that's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> the advantage of getting in early. Yeah, or having a name that nobody else has. I, I didn't have to fight hard for mine. That's true. That's true. <laughs> well, this has been episode 221. Guys, come on by Marketing SF. SF. <laughs> I don't even, it's 221. It's been a long time. MarketingSFF.com for the links that I mentioned. You can check out Jeffy's stuff. And thank you for joining us and thank you for listening, everyone. Hey, you guys all take it easy. Have a good one. So long, everybody. <laughs>